back to jobs, money, debt, economic common sense, a new online weekly video for debunking myths concerning unemployment, deficits, the national debt and our monetary system, and how we can create sustainable prosperity for the 21st century. Let the discussion commence. We're going to start with jobs. There is no single policy with as many potential benefits as true full employment at a living wage. This is because of the tremendous social and economic costs of unemployment for individuals, families, neighborhoods, nations, and the world. Almost every social problem that we have is directly or indirectly related to unemployment. Now, what do the so-called experts like the Chicago School say are the causes of unemployment? Lack of education and training. The unemployed don't have enough human capital and they suffer from a culture of poverty. We are all for training and education, but not training people for non-existent jobs. We're for on-the-job training, learning by doing, while getting paid. My friend Phil Harvey of Rutgers Law School and the National Jobs for All Coalition has a great way to understand how education and training alone are not enough to solve the unemployment problem. He laid it out in a book I co-edited called Commitment to Full Employment in 2000. It's a parable about dogs and bones. Say there are a hundred dogs on an island. Every day, a plane flies over and drops 90 bones down on the island. If a dog can get one bone, then 90 dogs get a bone and 10 go boneless. So the Chicago economists are called in to address this 10% rate of bonelessness. And they say that the 10 boneless dogs don't have enough motivation. They're lazy. They lack bone fetching skills. So they take the 10 boneless dogs and train them and educate them to be better bone fetchers. And then when the plane flies over and drops the 90 bones down, maybe some of those dogs get bones, but then others are boneless. As long as we don't increase the total number of bones, we will never eliminate bonelessness. We will only be changing the distribution of bones, but we will not change the 10% rate of bonelessness. It's a game of musical chairs. We're just rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. The only way to solve the persistent bonelessness is to increase the total number of bones. If dogs could get more than one bone, then it would take even more than 100 bones to ensure at least one for every dog. So the dogs are the labor force and the bones are the jobs. Unless there are at least as many jobs as job seekers, we will never eliminate unemployment. All the training and education in the world will not solve the unemployment problem unless we also increase the total number of job opportunities. So, are there as many job vacancies as unemployed people seeking work? Phil Harvey and others have conducted vacancy studies that show there are five, six, seven, and more job seekers for every vacancy. So training and education do not explain joblessness and do not address persistent unemployment. We need to increase the total number of employment opportunities. Then, of course, education and training are great. Guess who also understood this? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who wrote in his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here, that far too often, training becomes a way of avoiding the issue of employment. The orientation should be jobs first, training later. Unfortunately, the jobs policy of the federal programs has largely been the reverse, with the result that people are being trained for non-existent jobs. Jobs should be jobs and understood as such, not given the false label of training. One of the themes we will have occasion to return to in the weeks ahead is that generally speaking, the unemployed and underemployed want to work if given the opportunity for a self-respecting job with decent wages and benefits. 
In 2001, the International Labor Organization invited me to advise the Ministry of Labor of Argentina, then going through a severe economic crisis with unemployment, poverty, and malnutrition rising at alarming rates. We proposed a community service employment program that turned out to be extremely successful. Later, some of my colleagues and students went back down and studied the program, interviewing participants, many of whom were women. Participants were asked to rank various characteristics of the program, such as, I contribute to the community, I learn new skills, I work together with others, I earn an income, and so on. Recall, these were very poor people. I earn an income was fourth or fifth on the list after things like I contribute, I learn, and I work. Of course, this is not really news. We know people desire to collaborate, contribute, be creative. These are very normal tendencies, part of being human. We have to increase the opportunities for people to learn and earn. That starts with increasing the total number of jobs.